So in our first lecture in our learning unit seven on chapter 19, which is complex uh, ionic equilibria, we talked about the chemistry that can happen with buffers. So we talked about qualitative aspects of buffers, what they are, and then we talked about some quantitative aspects of buffers and you know, finish up with a lengthy problem of if you had a buffered solution in a beaker and then you added one lump sum of either strong acid or strong base, after the chemistry happened, how would you figure out what the pH of that solution is? So what we move on to in lecture two here is sort of thinking about the same kind of concept, but we're going to do it in terms of thinking about a titration. And we're actually going to start out with a strong acid, strong base titration, which actually means we aren't going to have equilibria going on. It's just completely chemistry, but it's just easing us into thinking about how the calculations work with titrations. And so again, with a titration, we're going to think about different volumes that uh, we will be adding, and we'll think about reaching an equivalence point. So conceptually, what we're going to be doing is sort of thinking about dynamic calculations. And what I mean by that is we're following the progression of a reaction. So unlike our buffer problem, our sample problem 19.1, where we just added a lump sum of either strong acid or strong base, and there wasn't any change in volume, what we're going to talk about here is being at different points in a titration. Maybe before we start the titration, maybe before we get to the equivalence point, maybe at the equivalence point, maybe after the equivalence point. So depending on where we are in a titration process, that's going to change the kinds of chemistry that we might be uh, doing and the kinds of calculations that we're going to have to utilize. So similar kinds of calculations that we saw in our last lecture, where we're going to talk about who's present, what's the chemistry going on, did we have a volume change, and how can we figure out pH? So again, there's actually only one homework problem that's related to this, and there's really only one problem that we're going to work through today. It's not even a sample problem, but it's one that I've created to, to uh, talk about a strong acid, strong base titration. So before we do that, and most of you have already had a titration lab in lab, so you understand the concept of how a titration works. But just in case uh, you haven't or you'd like a refresher, I'm just going to go through a brief kind of overview of how a titration works. So when we do a titration, we're essentially looking at a chemical reaction that's occurring in a beaker where we have one reagent, and then we're dripping a second reagent in. So we're adding it a little bit at a time. So for our strong acid, strong base titration, what we're really going to have is, in this case, a strong acid that's living in our beaker, and then we're going to have a strong base that's being delivered in our burette. Just as a preview, where we're going to go in our lecture for lecture number three is that we're actually going to have a weak acid that we have in our beaker. Still a strong base in our burette, but when we have a weak acid that's down here, then we have a situation where we're going to have buffer solutions. So we'll deal with that in our next uh, lecture. But just as a heads up, the same kind of calculations we're going to introduce and practice today are going to be relevant in what we move on to in our next lecture. So just a few um, points of nomenclature here, some definitions to think about. Again, hopefully things that you talked about already in your lab class. We have um, an analyte, which is again going to be a solution generally of unknown concentration, and we're going to determine that concentration by doing chemistry with our titrant. So the titrant, again, is going to be a solution of known concentration. That's typically what you find in your burette. And then again, your analyte is going to be the solution that's in your beaker, and you're trying to figure out what the concentration of that is. So again, chemistry is going to be happening with your titrant and your analyte. And for this chemistry, we can clearly see that sodium hydroxide is going to react with hydrochloric acid to generate water and then sodium chloride. So the equivalence point represents the point at which, and again, the chemistry really here is hydroxide reacting with H+. So the equivalence point is when the moles of titrant that we're adding, in essence, the hydroxide, is going to be equal to the moles of analyte that was in our beaker. So again, that's going to be our H+. Plus. Just highlighting and remembering here that sodium cations and chloride anions in this chemistry are really just spectator ions. So the equivalence point represents that point at which 
all of the hydrox or the hydronium ions have been reacted with hydroxide that's been added. Now, at this point, the equivalence point is not something that's visible. What ends up being visible is the end point. And so if you remember your titration that you did in lab, there was a phenolphthalein indicator that you had in your HCl solution. That indicator in acidic solution is clear, but as soon as it becomes a basic solution, turns that hot pink color. So again, what happens at the equivalence point, there's no excess acid and there's no excess base. They've completely reacted with one another. It's not until you add that final little drop of excess hydroxide that all of a sudden the indicator changes color and you see that hot pink color. So again, that's how a titration is going to work. And so what we're gonna see here and what we're going to look at both graphically and then do calculations with is what happens when we do a titration. So again, acid-base titration curves are basically going to plot pH as a function of the volume of titrant added. So again, here we can see that the titrant is sodium hydroxide. That's what we were adding from our burette. So what we're measuring is the pH of the solution that's in our beaker. So again, that's gonna be our acid solution here. So if we have acid in our beaker, before the titration starts, we are going to be at a low pH because we have an acid. And as we start dripping in our titrant, we're gonna be doing chemistry and we're gonna be removing that hydronium ion from solution. And so we're gonna be slowly increasing the pH. And then at the equivalence point, we've reacted all of the acid in solution with the correct amount of base that's been added. And this is an important point to highlight the pH at the equivalence point for a strong acid, strong base titration is always going to be equal to seven. This is going to be a magic number to remember. If you ever have to do a calculation or answer the question, what's the pH at the equivalence point, and you know you've got a strong acid and a strong base, you don't even need to do any calculations. We know that it's going to be seven. So when we're doing sort of these um, titrations, there's two things that I want you to think about. The first is all of these are going to have sort of this S-shaped titration curve. And when we titrate starting with an analyte in solution that is an acid and we're adding in base, we start at low pH and then we transition through the equivalence point and end up at high pH. So we're gonna see this shape with um, several different titrations that we'll do. But again, when we start with our acid solution that is going to be um, in our beaker, we're gonna start at low pH. In general, we're gonna think about doing um, calculations at four different regions during our titration. The first is before the titration begins, so we've added zero amount of titrant. This two point represents any point along this line that is before the equivalence point. At the equivalence point represents this one specific data point here, and then four represents any region after the equivalence point. And why it's important to identify these regions is we do different types of calculations depending on where we are. So as a point of assistance, as you're doing any of these problems, the first thing that you want to do is figure out what's the volume that I need to get to my equivalence point. Once you know that volume, then depending on where you are in your titration, you're either going to be, in this case, the volume to reach the equivalence point will be 40 milliliters. So any volume of titrant added that's less than 40, but greater than zero is gonna be in this range and we're gonna use a specific calculation to look at that point. Anything that's gonna be after 40 milliliters represents this region where we are after the equivalence point. So the first thing that I'm gonna show you here is how you'd actually figure out and how you'd calculate what volume the equivalence point is going to be at. We know the volume that we're gonna have in our uh, beaker, but how much titrant do we need to add to get to the equivalence point? Now sometimes, and with a lot of the problems that we're going to do, this will be easy because the concentrations will be the same. So for example, in this titration, 
if we had say 50 milliliters of one molar HCl in our beaker and we had one molar sodium hydroxide in our uh, burette, it would take the same volume of sodium hydroxide to get to the equivalence point because they were the same concentration. But say it's not the same concentration. Say you had 40 milliliters of uh, 0.1452 molar NH3 that was in your beaker and you wanted to know how much strong acid you needed to add, well, we'd need to do a little bit of a calculation in order to figure that out. So that's what I'm gonna show you right now is how we could do a calculation to figure out the volume to reach the equivalence point. And this kind of a question could be one of the questions that you'd see on an exam. Not asking you to figure out a pH for a certain uh, point in a titration, just asking you what's the volume to reach the equivalence point. So let's first write a chemical reaction here so we can think about the chemistry that's happening. Because in our titration, what's going to be happening if we were to have a weak base, like NH3, reacting with a strong acid, like HNO3, the first thing that's going to happen is chemistry. And just like we saw with our buffer problem, the first thing that we're going to have happen is chemistry. And then after the dust has settled here, then we're gonna see who's left in solution and figure out pH. So for this problem, we're not actually figuring out pH. We just wanted to figure out how many milliliters of HNO3 will it take to get to the equivalence point. So let's write a chemical reaction or equation for the chemistry that's happening. So again, we're gonna have H or NH3 as our weak base. Now I'm just gonna write that it's reacting with H+. Remember HNO3 being a strong acid really exists as H plus and NO3 minus in solution. There's really none of it still together as HNO3. And as we learned last chapter, NO3 minus is really a spectator when it comes to pH um, uh, considerations. So it's going to react with the H plus that we have from our strong acid, and that chemistry is going to generate NH4 plus. So what we'd like to do is figure out how much HNO3 do we need to have in order to completely react with all of the NH3. So this really just becomes a stoichiometry problem like we saw in Gen Chem 1. So what we do is we can take the molarity that we have of the NH3 solution. So it's 0.1452 moles of NH3 in one liter. And I know that I've got 40 milliliters of it. So hopefully everybody is okay, and the, the uh, quicker you can get to being able to do some basic unit conversions like this in your head, seeing that 40 milliliters is 0 0.04 liters. So doing this conversion will allow me to get to the number of moles of NH3 that I have. Then I can use my balanced chemical equation to convert between moles of NH3 and moles of H+. Plus remember, which is really the same thing as the moles of HNO3, because this is a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one stoichiometry here. And because I know the molarity of my uh, HNO3 solution, I know that one mole of HNO3 is going to be equal to 0 0.1329 moles, I'm sorry, liters of HNO3. So again, just to highlight here, reviewing sort of this unit conversion, we start with the molarity. Molarity is the walk between, between moles and liters. So now I can get the liters of, of NH3 that I have, and then I can use my balanced chemical equation to allow me to change who I'm talking about. And then I can use the molarity of my HNO3 solution to ultimately give me the volume of HNO3 that I'd need to get to be at the equivalence point. So work out this math here and it ends up being 43.70 milliliters. And so let's just think about what this number means and see if it makes sense to us. So highlighting here, we had 40 milliliters of a solution that is a little bit more concentrated than what is going to be uh, what we're reacting it with. So hopefully it, it makes sense that I would need a little bit more of the HNO3 solution 
to completely react with all of this because it's less concentrated. So it makes sense that I've got a little bit more than 40 milliliters. So this determination of the equivalence point is important because if we were doing pH calculations with this problem, if I was delivering anything less than 43.7 milliliters, that would mean that I am before the equivalence point. And as we'll see in a minute, there's different calculations we do for before the titration begins, before the equivalence point, or after the equivalence point. So we need to figure out where that equivalence point is because then that's going to allow us to sort of figure out the kind of calculation that we're going to do. So again, not only an important skill for kind of doing these titration pH determinations, but you're likely to see just a question like this on the exam where I'm going to ask you what would be the volume to reach the equivalence point in this titration. Okay. So again, a couple of things to highlight here when we're doing sort of acid-base uh, titration curves. So thinking about what's really happening here, when we're adding our titrant, when we're adding that hydroxide from our burette, that hydroxide can do one of two things. The first option is it can do chemistry with molecules and solution. So in this range here, that's what's happening, okay? There are, is chemistry that's happening because that hydroxide that we're adding is doing chemistry with the H3O plus that's in solution. They're generating uh, water, that neutralization reaction is happening, and because of that, it does not contribute, and we shouldn't say not contribute at all, but it contributes minimally to a change in pH, so we don't see a very steep increase here. However, as soon as we start uh, running out of the H plus that's in solution, now there's actually not a lot of those molecules left, so those hydroxide molecules are going to be contributing to changes in pH. And as we get close to the point where all of the H plus molecules have been fully reacted, we're getting close to that equivalence point. And remember, at the equivalence point represents the point when all of the OH minus has been used to react with all of the H plus that's in our beaker. Okay, and then after that, the only thing that we're doing is we're continuing to add more hydroxide to solution. So in that case, we're going to be continuing to increase the pH. So this is um, just kind of a preview of the kinds of things that we're going to be doing. We are going to spend time in class looking at three examples of titration curves that you could possibly see. Um, and again, we're going to run through the calculations for each one of them. Uh, to highlight, you are likely to only see one example on your exam and one calculation on your exam. So as much as we're going to go through all four regions with all three types of titration curves, again, you're only going to be able to see one point on your test. There's just too much other information um, and the calculations are so involved. Okay, so today's class is focused on a strong acid strong base titration. So features that we're likely to see is the pH at the equivalence point will always be equal to exactly 7. And we also see a very steep transition through the equivalence point. There's no region where we have any buffer. So because of that, we have to make sure that we understand that there's no Henderson-Hasselbalch equation that we're going to be using here, but there's also no ice tables because there's no equilibria. So calculations are a little bit easier for this kind of a calculation, which is why we're tackling it first. Next class, we're going to do a weak acid strong base titration. So again, we're still going to start out at low pH because we're starting with an acid solution, but it's a weak acid. So remember, as soon as we react that weak acid with a strong base, we start making the conjugate base of that weak acid, which means we're creating a buffer. Remember, a buffer contains a weak acid and its conjugate base. So that's why we're going to see that there. Note that the equivalence point for this type of a titration is greater than 7. A way to remember this is when you have a weak, strong combination, whoever the strong guy is is going to determine where the pH ends up at the end. Because the strong belongs to the base, our equivalence point is going to be greater than 7. Now, one of them that we will 
touch on in class and I will ask you guys to think about and do calculations with outside of class is a strong acid weak base. So because the strong piece comes from our acid component, the equivalence point is going to have a pH that's less than 7. With this situation, we're actually going to have the weak base be what's in our beaker that we're titrating into. So the strong acid is in our burette. So in this example, we start out at high pH because we have a base that we're starting with. As we titrate in acid, we're going to be decreasing the pH, but again, starting out being in this buffered region because as we take and do chemistry and take some of this weak base and react it with a strong acid, we're going to take some of that weak base and convert it into its conjugate acid. And when we have a weak base and its conjugate acid in solution, we've got a buffer. Okay, so those are the three kinds of titrations you're likely to see. This is going to be today's class. This is going to be lecture number three. And this is going to be on your own. There's video solutions to work you through how to do this. But again, one that I want you to try on your own and kind of um, apply these principles that we've been learning is a strong acid weak base titration. Okay, so let's go through what we're going to do for that. At the end of your how do I know how to sheet, you're going to see this cheat sheet that walks through the different kinds of calculations you'll need to use for each of the three types of calculations. So our first one that we're doing is again, strong acid, strong base. So these are the kinds of calculations that you'll need to use depending on whether you are before the titration begins, any point before the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, or any point after the equivalence point. Okay, so I might come back and sort of refer to this sheet uh, briefly, but if you're able to have this out kind of at, uh, at your ability to look at um, while we do these problems, it could be helpful. Okay, so let's dive right into this problem. Um, qualitatively, we're just going to go through the different points that we're going to see on this titration. Again, we're going to be doing sodium hydroxide with hydrochloric acid. So before the titration begins, we haven't added any hydroxide, so no chemistry has happened. So if we think about what we have there in solution, we only have strong acid. And so we're gonna start with 40 milliliters of 0.1 molar uh, hydrochloric acid in our beaker. So if we were to look with a giant magnifying glass, we'd see the only things that are in solution are chloride ions, which are spectator ions, and then some H3O+. Now again, it wouldn't matter if we had 40 milliliters or 400 milliliters. Right? If it's 0.1 molar, we know then the concentration of H3O+. The concentration of H3O+, is the same as the concentration of acid, and it's going to be a very acidic pH. So all we need to do is essentially take the negative log of that concentration, and we'll have the pH that we start at. As we move into this second region, which really represents any one of these data points before the equivalence point, we've started adding in some sodium hydroxide. So if we imagine looking at the point where we've added 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, we've had some chemistry where we've neutralized some of the H3O+. So some of the H3O+, has reacted with the hydroxide and generated water. So here we can see if we have again our magnifying glass, we see some water in solution. We also see some sodium cations that comes from the addition of the sodium hydroxide. But remember, both sodium cations and chloride anions are spectators, so they're not doing anything with regards to pH. We still, though, have some H3O plus in solution because we are before the equivalence point. We haven't yet added enough hydroxide to react with all of the H3O plus. And again, we'll talk about the kinds of calculation that we do, but basically we're going to be using ICF tables to figure out how much H3O plus is left. We know we reacted some of it, but how much is left? And once we figure out that concentration, we're going to be able to figure out the pH. At the equivalence point is pretty easy. At the equivalence point, and again, if we know that we've got 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide and 0.1 molar um, HCl, we know that at 40 milliliters, we are going to be at the equivalence point. 
All of the H3O plus has been completely neutralized by an exact amount of hydroxide that's been added. So at this point, what we actually have in solution is we've got the sodium cations, the chloride anions, and everything has been converted to water. There's no H3O plus that's left, and there's actually at this point no excess hydroxide that's been added. So nothing can contribute to uh, an effective change in pH. So by definition, the pH at the equivalence point of a strong acid, strong base titration is seven. So if I flip back here to kind of my little cheat sheet, highlighting there's no calculation you actually need to do if you are at the equivalence point of a strong acid, strong base titration. The pH by definition is seven. So let's just talk about qualitatively the last part of the titration curve, any point that's after the equivalence point. And we just happen to have chosen here a point where we've added 60 milliliters of hydroxide. So at this point, there's no more H3O plus that's going to be rea reacting with that OH minus. So all of that OH minus is going to continue to increase the pH. And again, if we take a magnifying glass and look at what we have in solution there, we still have sodium cations. We've got chloride anions, those again doing nothing. We have the water that's resulting from neutralization of the acid that we had but now we're beginning to accumulate excess hydroxide. And so that is what's contributing to this steep increase in pH. So the pH is really a reflection of whatever hydroxide is present in excess. It's always going to be greater than seven. And if we flip back to our cheat sheet here, we can see, again, after the equivalence point, we're gonna use an ICF table to determine the number of moles that are in excess. And here again is where this problem becomes different from what we did in our first lecture. In order to find the concentration of that hydroxide, we need to take the moles of hydroxide that's in excess and divide by the new volume that we have because we've been mixing things together. That will give us the new amount of hydroxide and from there we can get pOH and then pH. So hopefully that made sense to walk through sort of the qualitative piece. So let's take a moment then and work through the actual calculations. Now I've already worked through the calculations that we have here, but again, I'm gonna encourage you, I will pause or give you an opportunity to pause the video if you'd like to work through the calculations on your own, or again, you can just let the video play to see how the calculations are worked out. So let's imagine, again, the first part here. And I, I didn't actually pause this here. Uh, hopefully this is sort of a review for you guys. If we've got 40 milliliters of a 0.1 molar HCl solution, before we've done anything with any titration, if we just think about what's there, we've got HCl in solution. Being a strong acid, it completely dissociates. Chloride's a spectator, not anything to worry about. We haven't added anything else, so there's no chemistry to consider. Because we haven't added anything else, there's no volume changes to consider. So with strong acid stuff, there's not gonna be any equilibria that we need to consider. So the pH is really a reflection of the acid concentration because that completely dissociates to give us a full um, amount of hydronium ion. So again, we know that the acid concentration is 0.1 molar, so that means the hydronium ion concentration is 0.1 molar. So again, the pH is the negative log of that H3O plus concentration. Negative log of 0.1 tells us that the pH before we start is gonna be equal to one. So that's more of kind of a chapter 18 type problem. What's the pH of a 0.1 molar HCl solution? It's going to be one. And keep in mind, I hope it makes sense, it doesn't matter if we had 40 milliliters or 400 milliliters. The fact is, is that concentration of H3O plus will be the same. Okay, so now let's imagine that we've added 40 milliliters of, I'm sorry, we've added 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide to the 40 milliliters of HCl that's in our beaker. So again, we're going to use a, an ICF table to figure out, and it's just again a way to keep track of what's going on, to figure out what's left. So see if this makes sense here. We've got 40 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl that's in solution, 
Again, chloride is not going to be uh, affecting anything here. So 40 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl that's in our beaker. And we're going to be adding 20 milliliters of 0.1 molar hydroxide. So we've added 0 .02, 0 0.002 moles of hydroxide and we had 0 0.004 moles of H+. So put those into an ICF table like we have here. The relevant chemistry in a strong acid, strong base titration is H plus plus OH minus gives water. So again, hydroxide here is going to be our limiting reagent because we are before the equivalence point. So again, we have 0 0.002 moles of hydroxide, 0 0.004 moles of H plus. We know that OH minus is going to be our limiting reagent. It's the smaller number there. We're going to use up all of it, and that also dictates how much H plus we use up. So at the end here, we're going to have a final number of moles of H plus we have of 0 0.002, and we've reacted all of the hydroxide. Okay, so here's where this problem becomes different. We see that we've changed the volume because we've mixed things together. We had 40 milliliters in our beaker and we've added 20 milliliters. So I'm gonna give you guys a chance to pause the video and see if you could work out the rest of the solution. We need to figure out what's the concentration of H plus because if we know the concentration of H plus, we can figure out pH. So see if you can figure that out and then Re, uh, start the video again to see if your answer is correct. So finishing out this problem, we started with 40 milliliters in our beaker. We've added 20 milliliters from our burette. So the new volume is 60 milliliters. So this is the number of moles of H plus. We don't want to take negative log of that. We need to figure out what's the concentration of H plus. So to figure out the concentration of H+, we are going to take the number of moles of H+, which we have right there, and divide by the volume of the solution, which we have right here. So the new molarity of H+, is 0 0.033 molar. Okay, We've actually decreased some of it. Remember we started out that it was 0.1 molar, so now it's down to about a third of what we started with. Okay. Now again, take the negative log of that number, that will give you the pH. So take a minute, pause if you need, take a look at this to make sure you understand why we're not taking negative log of that. Remember, this is the number of moles. We need to take the negative log of a concentration, not a negative log of a number of moles. And how this problem becomes different from what we did in our first lecture is we considered the fact that when we added that hydroxide, it came in a solution. So we need to consider how that volume change is affecting things. So not only are we decreasing the amount of H plus that we have, we're actually diluting it because we're changing the volume. Okay, so the next one is going to be thinking about at the equivalence point. I'm going to show you here with this calculation, but I'll let you know if you know you are at the equivalence point of a strong acid, strong base titration, you can just say answer is going to be 7. But I'm going to show you real quickly here with our calculations why that's the case. So when we're at the equivalence point, we know we've got 0 .004 4 moles of H+. Plus and we've added 0 0.004 moles of OH minus. That's bigger than we had in our previous calculation. So looking at what we have here, neither of these is really the limiting reagent. This is what it means when we have stoichiometric equivalence. I know that sounds like a really big word, but when we're doing a limiting reactant problem, that really just means nothing's left over. Nobody's a limiting reactant. We've got the perfect matched amount of each. So again, what this means is we're going to have no hydronium ions that are left because we added the exact perfect amount of hydroxide. So at the end of the day, there's really nothing left to contribute to pH. Those guys are equal. And so we're going to have a pH that's equal to 7. So again, none left here at the equivalence point. That's going to mean that the pH will be equal to 7.
So again, this is what we call stoichiometric equivalence. And that's when we have the number of moles of acid that are reacted equals the number of base that are added from our burette. Again, you don't need to do anything with the calculation if you know that you have a strong acid, strong base titration, the pH at the equivalence point is going to be equal to 7. All right, last point here. We are going to be at the point um, where we've gone beyond our equivalence point. Now the only thing that's going to be affecting the pH of the solution is the excess hydroxide that we've been adding. So let's take a look at that here. Again, always kind of have this part in the beginning where we say who's in solution. Well, we didn't add any more stuff to our beaker. We still only had 40 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl, so we still only had 0.004 moles of H+. But now in adding a total of 60 milliliters of sodium hydroxide, that means we've added 0.006 moles of our hydroxide. Now what this really means is our H plus has become our limiting reagent. So we have an excess now of our hydroxide. So I, again, I encourage you pause the video here. We know the number of moles of hydroxide that are in excess, but how do we figure out the concentration of hydroxide that is in excess? And then how do we use that to figure out pH? So go ahead and pause the video if you want to try to figure this out on your own or just let it play to see the worked out solution. So we treat this problem the same way we treated it when we were before the equivalence point and we had an excess of H+. We need to account for the fact that the volume has changed. So we started out with 40 milliliters in our beaker. We've added 60 milliliters from our burette. So the new volume that everything is together in is 100 milliliters. So that 0 0.002 moles of OH minus that's in excess is now contained in 100 milliliters. So taking the ratio of these two will give us the concentration of hydroxide that's in excess, which is 0 0.02 molar. Taking the negative log of this gives us pOH but remember to get pH, we can just subtract that from 14 and we get pH equal to 12.3. This should be a red flag for you if you wanted to write down that the pH was 1.7 because we know we should have an excess of hydroxide here. We should have a pH that's greater than 7. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too much to kind of hurt your brain, but to kind of highlight how we handled the calculations for each of these points. Before the titration begins, because we've got a strong acid, whatever the initial acid concentration is, just take the negative log of that, and that's your pH. Pretty straightforward there. That's a chapter 18 kind of problem, but pretty straightforward because we've got a strong acid. Before the equivalence point, what that means is when we add um, our titrant, it's not going to be in excess. We're still going to have some of the strong acid that's in our beaker being in excess. We can use an ICF table to figure out exactly how many moles are in excess because the hydroxide that's added from our burette in this case is going to be um, the limiting reagent. So we'll determine the moles of H plus that are left over and then we need to make sure to divide by the total volume because the volume has been changing because we've been dripping our titrant in. In order to figure out the H3O plus concentration, we need to know the moles that have remained and then divide by the new volume that we have. Again, point three, you actually don't even need to do a calculation. If you know that you've got a strong acid, strong base titration, by definition, the pH will be equal to seven. No calculations need to be done. We actually just did the calculations there to highlight um, uh, and prove that we didn't have any excess acid or base at that point. After the equivalence point, the flip happens of what happened at, uh, before the equivalence point. After the equivalence point, now we're going to have hydroxide in excess. It was H plus that was still in excess in the previous step. So now having hydroxide in excess, we can now divide by the total volume and we're going to be able to figure out then hydroxide concentration. Remember that will give us pOH. We need to subtract that from 14 in order to give us pH. So that wraps up our second lecture
again in our monster chapter here, thinking about complex ionic equilibria. So what we'll move on to on our next lecture is still doing titrations, but now we'll begin to think about what happens when we have a weak acid strong base titration.